Now, it's always true that when you have displacement conditions in a problem, you've then already specified the field variable at that point. And this will, in effect, reduce the size of the problem because that can be exploited. Particularly when you set a displacement to be zero, that equation becomes relatively easy to separate out and solve as a separate final step. In our case, I'll do this slowly and show how that can happen. Once you see this, you'll understand how that works. The fact that there's a zero in this first displacement position means that you have eliminated the first column of that matrix because when you post multiply by a matrix, each of those terms affects the matrix here column-wise. So I know that this zero will knock out all of these terms in the first column. Knock them out, I mean uh, cause them to be zero when you multiply by zero. You could at that point deflate this equation and, and this set of equations by shrinking this to three rows times two columns and pulling out the zero up there and making it a two vector, uh, but thereby leaving a three vector on the right hand side. Now, matrix multiplication tends to sum over the nearby indices and will effectively eliminate the um, index that ranges from 1 to 2. Now, of course, that's the column index in the first matrix, and it's the row index in the second. Now, we can do something further. We really have three equations and two unknowns. So we may take the first equation and set it aside. It has been the equation that is largely um, meant to describe u1, but that was set to be zero, and so we'll pull that equation aside, and it becomes merely f1 is a constant times u2. This could be solved later if needed, or can be ignored. Notice that f1 is a reaction in the system. So in other words, when you apply the live loads on over here, you're able to set aside the equations for which you would find the reactions here, and those can be solved at the end if you wish. Many computer codes will ask the user, do you want to find the reactions? Sometimes they're called constraint forces in the problem. And if you don't ask for it, you won't get it because it's a separate step. Now we're left with a two by two set of equations shown here, and this is a solvable set of equations. I know physically that we've removed the rigid body mode because we've pinned the left end, and therefore that pair of rods cannot translate along their own axis. They're constrained in space. Another way to look at that is to look at the determinant of this equation, and you'll find that it is positive. It's six minus four, which is two. So you are guaranteed to find an equation solution. Now the solution of a two by two set of equations isn't real glorious and I won't labor on it long. We'll just use conventional high school elimination of variables where you add equations and subtract and uh, work with the coefficients. In this case we add the two co equations and that directly gives the displacement at the center node. Then you could go back into the first equation say and find the deflection at the right node. And that ratio then is in the ratio of 0.15 millimeters to 0.1 millimeters. Uh, not being evenly divided because the rightmost rod is stiffer. That really solves the problem and I put the little check mark here to indicate how self-satisfied we all are right now. But if we wanted to go back and get the force of constraint, we could use that equation that we temporarily set aside, and we would find that it is minus 1,000 newtons. And that completes the problem, bringing us all three of the unknown quantities that we did not know at the start. And I sketched those all in the diagram here below. Now, when I teach, it's often a burden to try to keep the student from 
guessing an answer and putting it into the set of original equations. And this gets things all scrambled up. So for instance, many people will look at this problem and say, well, I saw that that load at the left end was minus 1,000 newtons. And they'll put that into the equation. And before long, things get tangled up. And you've got either too many or too few equations, and uh, typically too many. And so I would say, play this game honestly. Don't guess the answer, because the equations are exactly right to solve for all the unknowns for you. Our second problem has to do with the definition of the stiffness matrix. I'm going to give some physical information and then see if you can infer what the stiffness terms ought to be. This was originally an exam problem and did cause quite a bit of consternation among the students taking the exam. I gave some physical properties of a spring namely coil diameters and so on. And then I gave some experimental information and asked the students to calculate as many terms in the stiffness matrix as they could. Now, first of all, a lot of people couldn't figure out how to handle a matrix like the, that would correspond to this problem. Notice that there is both a translation and a rotation at each of the two nodes. So there really are four degrees of freedom. Now, many people, when they see this, immediately try to break this into two two-by-two two stiffness matrices. But as you'll see in a minute from the experimental data, there is coupling between the two, such that if you pull on this spring, it will want to unwind, and it will put a, an opposing moment on the node. And so really, of the four degrees of freedom, you must study all four. And you have a four-by-four four matrix with 16 components. The two experiments are simple and are described here. First of all, we propose that the left end is clamped and that displacements are imposed on the right end. Notice that I'm using the blue arrows here for the displacement information and the red arrows here. So these displacements, in the presence of constraints over here, cause these reaction forces. And there is this coupling that um, what we've really done then is imposed a single displacement U3, and then we've recovered these two forces. Now, if you think about it, that's directly the definition of some of the stiffness terms, because they are, in fact, the force at a given degree of freedom due to unit displacement at only another degree of freedom. So we, it turns out we have enough information right here for two of the stiffness terms relating to these two degrees of freedom. Uh, likewise, the second experiment uh, is a unit rotation. Now, that's a little large, but we'll say it's within the range. The radian measure is a little bit awkward for a problem such as this, but our spring is, uh, maybe it's got a lot of turns and can handle that. And the same thing happens, that you get both a, an opposing force and here a, um, an opposing moment. Now, to hold this displacement U3, 0, will require some horizontal force here. So it's not as if this uh, body's not in equilibrium. There are enough forces to do the job. OK, we're going to assume the spring remains linear, even under that one radian uh, rotation at the end. And the viewer is asked, using elastic symmetry, geometry, and equilibrium concepts, construct the stiffness matrix for this spring. And then a second um, add-on problem is that uh, suppose you had two such springs, how can you assemble them? And that's, that's a relatively easy problem. So let's solve the problem. Our first experiment was the one where we had reaction forces here, and the impressed displacements were shown here. We actually were given all four displacements under the statement that the left end was clamped and those reactions were in the presence of no rotation and translation. And remembering that post-multiplication by a vector here causes this component, the third component here, to multiply the third column over here. So the first two forces over here are going to allow us to solve for these stiffness terms that are in red, K13 and K23. 
Literally, K13 is the translational force on degree of freedom 1 due to a unit translation at only degree of freedom 3, and that number was minus 100. So we immediately can solve for that. Likewise with K23 being the moment at 2 due to a unit translation at 3 gives us immediately that quantity, and then I enter that below directly into the stiffness matrix. The second experiment is similar. It's actually a unit rotation in the fourth degree of freedom. We know the reactions at the left end, and again, we're able to directly solve for K14 and K24, getting the numbers minus 50 and minus 100. So right off the bat, from the direct interpretation of those experiments, those experiments were definitely set up to give you stiffness terms directly. To this point, we've actually found four of the 16 coefficients in that matrix. But now let's tinker with the data. We know that when we were given reactions at the left end of that spring, that we can then, through static determinacy, we can find the live loads at the right end that really go along with those enforced displacements. So from equilibrium, we can immediately find what F3 and F4 are. They're the negatives of the quantities on the left end. That, in effect, doubles the power of the experiments because we can now take our first experiment where we imposed a unit translation on the right end and we can say, hey, that was going to take uh, these live loads since, since they have to balance these. Now, in a sense, I'm violating something I said earlier uh, about problems where I didn't want you to guess the answer. But now we've been given really an inadequate amount of information to try to do the task at hand. So I'm, I'm grabbing at any straw that I can. And that will directly give us K3-3 and K4-3. These turn out to be positive numbers. And I enter those in the next sequence below. The second experiment for the unit rotation at the right end um, would cause these loads to be generated on the right end in order to balance these, as we saw before, and directly let you find the next two terms. We've now found eight out of the 16 stiffness coefficients, and I embed those four that were recently found into this matrix. Now, Regardless of the shape of the body, there is a reciprocity theorem. It really has to do with symmetry of the elastic stiffness matrix. Some people call it the Raleigh-Betty-Maxwell reciprocity theorem, and so on. But what it means is that Kij has to equal Kji. And that immediately tells you for our body, regardless of its shape, as long as it's an elastic material, we'd have to have the off-diagonal terms in the lower left equal to the off-diagonal terms in the upper right. And that gives us another four entries immediately. That was pretty easy, and that's basically a material symmetry. It has to do with conservation of energy. You can prove that Kij has to equals Kji if you take two loads and apply them in one order and then remove them in the opposite order, and then you check out the energy that is released upon removal and make sure that it's the same as energy stored, and you always find that Kij has to equal, equal Kji. All right, the last point is really pretty subtle, and I can understand why people couldn't get the final four terms in this matrix. Uh, a simple way would be to walk around to the other side of the springs and then just use a different numbering on the uh, nodes and say that by geometric symmetry, whatever happened on that one when the body was facing one direction should happen in a mirror image facing the other. This is a kind of a geometric symmetry about the uh, center of the body. Uh, another way to think of it is that the system should be invariant. The forces should be invariant. That means they shouldn't change under a rigid body 
translation. So I'm going to use that second idea, namely, rather than moving the right end a given distance and holding the left end fixed, what if you proposed uh, this second situation here where you move the left end a unit to the left and held the right end fixed. Now that's a um, kind of a mirror image problem to the one over here that we were originally given. And my claim is that the forces should be the same in those two problems. And then a way to rationalize that is the only difference is a rigid body translation of one millimeter. It's the body is under the same forces and, and uh, deflections other than that. And if you do that, then that's effectively a minus one translation on the left end that produces the same forces as previously you got from a plus one translation here at the right end. And that will directly let us find K11 and K1 and K21 shown here and here. And finally, we can do another mirror image problem like that. So I'll propose a similar experiment in regard to the rotary uh, displacement. <clears throat> Here's my mythical experiment in which I fix the right end and I have a minus one radian rotation at the left end. That should cause the same forces and moments as the original experiment did, with the only difference being a one radian rigid body motion different in the two. When you do that, you immediately pick up K12 and K22, which finishes the entire stiffness matrix. I think many people when they first see this problem are a little mystified as to how you could get more than four of the components and here in fact we've gone ahead and gotten all 16. The add-on problem part B had to do with assembling two of those springs in parallel and of course that assembly is very similar to our addition of the two rod elements, except this time we have rotary degrees of freedom in addition to translational. So here we join, and this time we're going to get an overlap in these center two degrees of freedom. So effectively we are overlapping two four by four matrices this time, and they both add stiffness to the center two coordinates. And if the on-diagonal terms were 100 units each, then the sum of two of them is 200 units. And it happened to be the same for both rotation and translational effects. On the off-diagonal, we had 50 units and from each of the uh, contributing pairs, and so we end up with 100 on these uh, off-diagonal terms. So not too hard, really, to assemble two such elements. Make sure you understand this. Make sure that you know that you couldn't break this down into a two by two problem because it doesn't uncouple. Problem three is a more difficult assembly problem in two ways. One is that I'm going to assemble different elements that are connected in a more complicated way. And secondly, because we're in two dimensions now, I'm going to make use of a shorthand notation called compact notation. It turns out that the connectivity in assemblies really depends on the nodal numbering. The reason is that the degrees of freedom, whether there's one or six at a node, all have the same connectivity with other nodes. They're either all connected or there are none of them connected. This is because the little individual stiffness matrix is typically full and all the degrees of freedom at one node affect all the degrees of freedom at another node. As a result, you can exploit that simplification and only keep track of the connectivity between the node numbers. So here you see we have a triangle on the left denoted by alpha. And alpha then will connect nodes 1, 2, and 3. And I show that, and you can block that out here basically. In fact, of course, each of these little alpha symbols stands for a little 2 by 2 matrix, if you want to think in that term. That would be the compact way of, th uh, sorry, that would be the detailed way of thinking of the uh, variables. But we're not doing that, we're doing compact. The other triangle called beta, 
contributes beta, beta, beta over here between 4, 5, and 6, and adds this little block of symbols in red. The upper rod, gamma, um, is in the blue color, and it connects nodes 2 and 5, and that's a little more widespread. You have to put in K22, K25, here's K52 and K55. Whereas delta down below connects 3 and 4, which is again pretty compact. And so these terms all connect together. And again we have some bandedness here that there's a uh, set of zeros that lie outward of these diagonal lines. Our fourth problem is not a standard problem in finite element technology. I'm going to get an exact solution to a tapered rod, and the exact answer will come out logarithmic. Now, we usually don't use transcendental functions for interpolating the field variables, but uh, we will follow this one as an exact solution. If I have this tapered element here with an area that's changing from some baseline value A0 at the left end to some quantity B times that at the right end. It's really 1 plus B. Uh, then, for instance, if B were unity, this would double in size from the left to the right end. And let's use an equilibrium equation. And if we find the exact solution, we'll find it will not be a polynomial. Now, there's some trickery involved here. We don't have our full power up yet for our energy methods, so um, don't be dismayed by the solution procedure here. It is a little tricky. The one thing we would know about this element is that at the right end, there would be a force F2. And if I made a, a cut in the interior of the body and looked at a small free body diagram of the right end, I would get that the stress in the interior would have to be that force over the total rod area. Now, involving these um, X terms here, you see. So we already have the internal stress evaluated in terms of the force at the right end. Now we can use Hooke's law to get the internal strain merely by taking the stress over the Young's modulus. And that just adds this E factor in here. Now, strain in the engineering strain is just du dx. And the fundamental theorem of calculus is that if you know what the derivative of a function is, then you can get the function by integrating and you'll cough up a integration constant here, which will figure out that if we integrate from the left end to some intermediate position, then the, we have to account for the deflection at the left end, which is merely the deflection of the left coordinate. So um, if the body has moved a bit on the left, then that's our, that is the quantity U1. In any event, we evaluate this integral. We know what the strain is. We just found it up above, put that in. You can integrate that directly, adding this constant of integration, and you end up with a logarithmic function. I think at this point, it, it's kind of a strange problem yet. But if you see what we've done, though, we really have found the internal displacement field now as a function of things that are happening on the end of the body. And so we're certainly getting it over to a discrete form. Perhaps the strongest trick here now is to evaluate the displacement field at the right end. We tied in what happened at the left end because of a constant of integration. But now let's use this trick. If we take that field displacement and we know that that's identically U2 when we evaluate it at the right node, then we just put that value in and the X over L term becomes unity and you get this. Now, what you've got now is even more strong than before because now we have the force at the end related to the displacements at the ends. So we solve for the force and we get this equation. <laughs>
But by equilibrium, because this is a statically determinate structure, we can just say that F1 has to be minus F2. We saw that for the line element earlier, the uh, rod element. And all that is is a change in sign. Now, if you think about it, we're back to that position we were before where you have two unknowns on the left side and you look at the two equations and you find that on the right side you have the two unknowns, but sprinkled among the coefficients. So just by collecting terms and putting the u1 and u2 in a little more careful term on the right side here, you're going to find that this is exactly the matrix relation and will give you this stiffness, that you have this leading constant here plus this symmetric set of terms that show the input-output relation of the force. Now, the reason that I've done this little problem is because this exact answer is helpful a little bit later in evaluating some of the approximate methods when you might attack this same tapered element. Problem five is just a discussion of the displacement fields and the way that we interpolate the internal displacement in a finite element. For our two-noted line element or rod element, a person could define this field displacement as a constant term and then a linear term. And we could call that a displacement function. We're going to do quite a bit of work a little later on our energy methods with what are called shape functions. And that's where you relate the field displacement to what's happening at the nodes. Now that takes this pair of functions here, which are interpolation functions. We'll talk a lot about those later. One thing that I just thought I would have you look at, though, is whether there's a relation between these two ideas. And Notice that this is just a um, straight mathematical polynomial form, but there's something physical here. You're trying to take the nodal displacements and multiply times a known function. Now, in both cases, you've got basically two unknowns. Here you have generalized coordinates Q1 and Q2 that characterize the field displacement. Here you have nodal coordinates U1 and U2 that characterize the displacement field. Are those related in any way? Well, it turns out, yes, they are, because if you evaluate at the left end, let's say, if you take the uh, first equation for the displacement function, you'll find that u1 is q1, and there is no uh, function of x there, and then q2 would be times 0, so that would drop out, and you get immediately that q1 was u1. In other words, in this polynomial form, this displacement function, you can identify that the first generalized coordinate is going to be the displacement of the left end of the rod. Now, we stumbled on that actually in our tapered rod, too, but that's, a, that's just a coincidence. That's no big deal. Now, the other thing you can do is evaluate at the right end. You take the displacement polynomial again with the L for the x dependence, set that equal to u2, and uh, then you can relate what Q2 is in terms of the displacements at the ends. And really all I wanted to show here is that these two approaches are complementary. They say things in a little different way, but they're interchangeable. And so start thinking about what it means to have an interior displacement field, and then how can you characterize that either by a set of polynomials with generalized coordinates or by using the nodal displacement somehow to tame the situation and, and give um, the sizing to the displacement field.